Hello everyone, welcome to today's webinar, Market Research for Product and Marketing Leadership. Just a few quick things to point out. We will have a, a short poll later on, so watch for that screen to pop up and you'll be able to answer a question. And also, if you have a question that you'd like to, to ask, you can ask that question at any time. We will hold those until the the end of the formal part of the presentation and then we will open it up to those questions but in the questions box you can enter those questions at any time and we'll be able to uh, pull those up at the end in in the event that we do not have enough time to get all of the questions answered we will follow up with you directly on your question so uh, we'll make sure that that gets answered so I'd like to welcome the other panelists today First, we have Dorian Simpson, the Chief Innovation Officer for Planning Innovations. Dorian, welcome and thank you for joining today. Hi, James. Thank you. I also have Sophie King, the Program Director for China Inno. Sophie, pleasure to have you here today. Thank you. Hi, thanks, James. Uh, China Inno the Sophie. Uh, China Inno the workshop, Sophie, you took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> and my name is James Worth. I'm the marketing manager for Question Pro, and I'll be hosting today. So we have a lot of really, really impactful content. And so we're going to jump right in, but just a quick reminder, because I see a few more people have joined. If you have a question throughout, just use the questions box, and we'll be able to see that and make sure you get your questions answered. Okay, so let's jump into this great content. First thing I want to do is, uh, is introduce Dorian. Now, Dorian has worked in product development and marketing for over 20 years, and this is with major brands such as IBM, Motorola and numerous other market leaders and in China Dorian has worked with China Inno for over eight years to deliver product management and innovation programs in fact some of you may have taken his workshops in the past he also just released this book that, that you see on your screen the savvy corporate innovator to help innovators in established companies get funding for their big ideas and this book features such things as a step-by-step -step action plan for building compelling proposals and it's available in physical and ebook formats. Dorian, I'm going to turn it over to you and uh, so please just take it away. Great, thank you. I'm looking for the uh, control. There it is. Great. Okay, so can you see my screen? Yep, looks good. Actually, no. You're not seeing it yet. You can't, Sophie. I I cannot see the screen actually. Oh, not now it's okay. So we okay. might have a little bit of delay. So just by way of quick announcement, if anyone else is having that delay as well, um, just appreciate your patience. It looks like it might be taking a little bit since we're circling the globe with this webinar. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thank you, James. I appreciate everybody's time today. Um, and thank you for listening in English. I know this is probably not your uh, your first language for many of you, so I'll try to be uh, clear um, and speak uh, as clear as possible. So you know, market research is a big topic. I know in my 20 years of working with successful managers or executives, um, one of the reasons we're holding this webinar is it's such a critical skill uh, to drive success for these individuals. I can't think of any executive I've worked with that isn't looking for market research as part of their uh, decision making and they're looking for their marketing and product leaders to provide to provide that research and provide that data. So I always view it um, thinking about as a professional and getting professional results almost any time you're um, looking at getting a professional job. It takes the right set of tools and the right set of skills uh, to really get professional results. And I experience that personally. I, I do a lot of uh, woodworking. It's kind of a hobby. And I'm always out looking for the right tool to get that perfect result. And I kind of equate market research uh, very similar. Is that It's really a toolbox uh, we're looking at. And you have to pull out the right tool at the right time to get the exact results you're looking for. So it's a big topic, and we're going to focus on just to provide some tips today to give you kind of a foundation for success. 
Some of you might be fairly new to um, some of the research tools and skills we're going to talk about today. Some of you might just be looking for refreshers. Uh, but we're going to cover some foundations in four parts. Uh, we'll address some of the key questions that we're really looking to get answered from customer research. And I'm going to share with you just a general approach to structure research to almost always get reliable results. And I'm going to just share with you some of the things that I see people uh, don't do uh, and don't get the right results uh, by following a different structure and some of the challenges that creates. Um, then I'll share with you just from my experience just five tips to think about how to apply market research uh, in the right way. And then we're going to open it up to Q&A and we're even open uh, if you have suggestions or thoughts on your experiences with market research, uh, that would be a great time to share it. So we're going to go through at a fairly uh, healthy clip fairly quickly and I want to make sure we have time for Q&A. Um, let's just dive into part one and just think about if you're involved in market and product leadership, well, what are some of the questions that you really need to have answered? And at the top level, you know, you're all probably in very competitive markets and at the big, at the big picture, the purpose of market research is really to drive market success. And the challenge is when you're developing products or marketing programs, you don't really know what's going to be successful in the market, particularly when you're trying to sell those ideas and programs in the company. You're going to need data to really drive your strategy, your planning, and your tactics. And that's where market research comes in, is giving you that foundation of data to really understand how to make decisions in products and marketing plans. So thinking about the range of market research uh, as a toolbox, um, you might have asked when you saw this webinar announcement is, well, where is the focus? Market research is such a big topic, where are they going to focus? So this gives you just a visual of you can really structure market research in two primary dimensions. You're probably familiar with these. On uh, one dimension, on the left side, we've got secondary and primary research. And secondary research, I'm pretty sure most of you are very comfortable with. You probably get industry reports. You're out on the web looking at comp uh, competitors and you're getting a lot of uh, information from your channels. That's secondary data. That's data that you really haven't gathered yourself. It's coming from other sources. And that's usually the source of market insight where you're looking at big trends and big, big numbers that's happening in the marketplace. The other part of that dimension is primary research. And that's the data that you have specifically gathered. It's unique to your company. It's unique to your plans. And that's really the type of research we're talking about. And that's going to give you the competitive edge. It's getting the data, getting the customer insight that you, uh, about your customers, your markets, and your products that your competition doesn't have. And that's really the source of leadership for any product manager or product marketer is having that primary research. On the bottom dimension is we got qualitative and quantitative. That's two other sides of the dimension. And qualitative is just understanding deep, understanding uh, more, you get smaller numbers and you're trying to understand more specifically uh, in more detail and get more nuance from customers, get that insight. On quantitative, you're looking for numbers. You're looking for uh, statistically accurate results where you can say with confidence of plus or minus 3% or plus or minus 5% that this is the right information that we can use uh, to make decisions. So we're going to focus on the primary customer research side and really thinking about customer insight. That's our focus. So if you're thinking about using market research more, um, uh, more deeply in your company, or if, even if it's the first time you're thinking about using it, you might be getting some an interesting objection. Uh, sometimes there's an interesting sentiment, sometimes among research and development folks and even designers, where they might come back, you say, okay, I'm going to do some market research, and you might get a pushback. Well, customers can't tell you what they want, so why should we spend our time and energy doing primary research if customers can't even tell us? And sometimes they'll even quote on the left side, I've got Henry Ford, who's famous for his quote, if I asked customers what they wanted, they would have said, faster horses. 
and that was fine at the time. Uh, he decided he would create one product, it would come in black, and when you have a growing market and you've got that leadership, maybe he didn't need to uh, do a lot of customer insight. Uh, but in competitive markets, uh, Henry Ford would have to think about that. Uh, more recently, Steve Jobs is often quoted as Apple doesn't do market research. And we'll talk about that in a second. But I just wanted to throw this out to the folks on the call is get your reaction and your attitude towards uh, customer research a little bit. Just answer this question if you can. And we'll wait a few seconds for you. And the question is just, just true or false, will or listening to customers will lead you to market success. And see if you answer that. I'd like to see, um, get your opinions uh, from the folks on the call. If you think that listening to customers will lead you to market success. I want to see if we could get some answers from people. So the so poll is up, Dorian. So everyone, if you could choose true or false on the screen, we'll be able to, to tally those in just a moment. OK, great. So we'll give a few seconds for folks. More people are voting. I, this is great. This is like gamification live. <laughs> I love it. So is this a pass-fail kind of question here or a thought-provoking, conversation-provoking question? Or how should we be thinking about this? Yeah, it's not, it's not a pass-fail. You can't get it wrong. <laughs> um, it, really, it's an attitude. And there's, you know, um, you know, one of my answers always, uh, particularly as a consultant, is there's never one answer to any question. It's always, it depends. <laughs> yeah. I, think, um, I think we have enough. To, we don't have statistical accuracy yet, but I think we've got a pretty good trend. <laughs> okay, great. So we've got two-thirds of people that said this is true, and one-third that says it's false. And I think, uh, to me, and I'll just give you my answer, is that uh, it's both true and false. Um, I think you'll, you'll agree that only listening to customers won't lead you to the market success. There's all kinds of factors of strategy and your market situation and, and how well you execute on what you learn. I like to look at it almost the reverse. If I said the statement, not listening to customers will lead to market failure, then I think almost unequivocally, I could say, that is true. And I see that again and again in the market. Um, and why is that? So in my, uh, so there's been a lot of research done on why products fail. And this is uh, consistent results across research studies, is that the five most common reasons that products fail in the market all come down to understanding customer needs and the product market fit. And things like, uh, understanding the target market and being clear on the target market, having customers see the benefits, um, even down to our marketing isn't able to sway buyers into buying the product or if we're creating a new product in a new category, customers just don't get it. These are the top five reasons products fail and I think what's interesting is that all of them can be really solved with the right customer research approach. And I've done a lot of post-mortem Postmortem just means after a product has failed, you go back and look at the, the reasons. And almost in every case, you could point to uh, some of the early failings of um, the team being able to get enough customer insight to drive those strategic decisions. Uh, and just as a side, um, Apple does do market research. Uh, Steve's often quoted that they don't. But if you look at their products and even in their announcements, they do a ton of uh, techniques such as ethnography. They watch customers using products. They do a lot of rapid prototyping. They do a lot of feedback loops with customers. What they don't do is some of the more traditional uh, focus groups and surveys that a lot of companies have come to rely on. So Apple just takes it to another level. And we'll look at some of these uh, techniques at, at a pretty high level. And, and you asked the question in an interesting way. You talked about listening. So to mm -hmm. So my takeaway then is that listening takes many forms. It's not necessarily the traditional survey. Uh, many things such as ethno ethnography and probably we could probably incorporate um, you know, customer data or big data into that and any number of things as well. Yeah, that's a good point. When I say listening, I really mean the broad, the broad scope of how you're getting that insight from customers. Yeah, it could be observing, could be listening, it could be storyboarding, all kinds of techniques that you could use for listening to customers. So, so let's get back to the question of what, what are some of the questions that we're trying to answer with, with customer research. And it, 
it's a tough one because at the big picture, almost every business decision is going to rely on solid data. And data means market research. So just some of the specific questions that we can ask for market research is at the company strategy level, the big picture, picture, we're trying to use market research to understand who the target market is, understanding their needs, trying to quantify the market. As we move into product development, we're trying to be much more specific on are these the right features? Are we pricing it correctly? Do we understand how to meet market share goals? And then further down to when we're in sales and marketing, or what I'm calling commercialization here, we're trying to, uh, we might be asking questions about the value of our brand, how to build our brand. How can we demonstrate value through the right promotions? How do we optimize our price for profit? These are all questions that market research is going to answer. And what we're really talking about is not the market insight questions like the secondary data, we're really focused on the primary uh, research that we're trying to get with customer insight. So more specifically on some of the top questions that product and market leaders are trying to answer is if you're trying to, for example, you're in the mobile phone market and you wanted to create a competitor, let's say you're Xiaomi and you're looking for a, a killer product to take out the, the iPhone 6, you're going to be using market research to answer the question, how might we develop a game-changing product? If you have uh, maybe slightly less ambitions and you're looking for just an incremental product advantage, you might be asking that question. Um, Honda did a lot of research with consumers in understanding how parents use their SUVs, and they determined that a lot of times they have messy kids. Customers of SUVs, of course, have kids that spill food all over it. And they saw these parents bringing out vacuum cleaners out to their cars. And they learned through survey techniques and others that putting a vacuum cleaner in the car would give them a significant product advantage. And it became a, a, a good seller for them, increased their market share, and created huge brand awareness for Honda for this, for this one incremental advantage. So that's on the product side. On the marketing side, you might be asking questions. Well, how do I identify a compelling new marketing campaign? Um, if you know the Nike slogan, just do it, that made uh, Portland, I'm from Portland, Oregon, by the way, in America, and it made Wyden and Kennedy, their ad agency, uh, famous for this one three-line saying, just do it. And it seems interesting. A lot of people don't think uh, customer research is that involved when you do these creative types of campaigns, uh, but they did a ton of research in understanding customer needs. And to get down to that three-word statement, that became uh, Nike's famous uh, branding campaign. So those are some of the questions we're trying to answer. One of the questions I often get from product uh, and mar product managers and uh, product marketers is the challenge of budget. And we can talk about market research and, and doing customer research activities. And the question always comes back, well, I don't have a big budget. And I'm just sharing this with, even if you don't have a, a big budget, if you can identify just a small number of tools that you can use at the right time and you get proficient at them, you can move up this asymptotic curve to get enough customer insight drive good strategic decisions. Um, often see um, if you don't do any research, you're in the world of guessing, and that's a very high risk for both your career and for your market and, and for your products in the market. Um, often see uh, what's interesting is that companies, sometimes large companies, have very large market research budgets, and they do all these kinds of activities, and this is what we'll address in, in part two, they do lots of activities, they might launch tons of surveys, and then they still find that they're not getting the answers that they need. So I put that in the realm of wasted research. So it really takes a set of skills, a set of tools applied, with, and our goal is to be the most efficient, the most effective as we can with the smallest number of tools we can. However, the good news is, oh, well, I think one of the, uh, the big innovations in market research is that there's a, a wide range of tools that are now available to uh, product and market leaders. And 
we can get much more specific and ask much more targeted questions using more targeted techniques. I remember even just 10 years ago, if you tried to use an online survey, you had to be very, use very simple questions and you only had a few techniques. And if you wanted to do more complex research, it might have cost you forty or fifty thousand dollars to get customized software to do that. So with some of the online tools, and that's why we brought um, uh, James and Question Pro into these into these programs, is that uh, they've done a great job of pulling together a wide range of tools. And I think that's one of the big innovations um, in market research is the range of tools that you can get now at a much lower cost than you could have just years ago. So we don't have time to go through each one of these tools uh, or the features of Question Pro, but I'm just going to share with you some of the some of the major things, uh, some of the major tools and usage around uh, customer research tools. So, um, as an example of a targeted tool, is if you have uh, widely distributed customers and you're looking for feedback, you're going to need tools that can go out across regions. It's going to have multiple multiple languages that you can employ with the same survey. And I think one of the interesting um, innovations using online, I don't know if you've ever done a focus group where you try to bring people into a room, you can use online video today and do online or virtual video for a fraction of the cost you could do a focus group even five or six years ago. So I think that's, that's exciting is, is the possibility with research today. So, you know, James, what do you think, if, you know, you're involved in this, you see a lot of techniques and tools, what do you think is one of the biggest advancements in customer research tools in the last couple of years? Yeah, I think certainly introduction of video and even more broadly engagement, you know, two-way engagement uh, so, that, so that the survey creator and the survey taker are now um, going down this path together and video is a great example of that creating an online community where you can engage again and again with with followers or uh, supporters of a product or a, or a service or a, even a niche, more generally a niche market. So I think you definitely um, called out one of the most important ones. Another one would be that, that we're able to now gather um, data from a number of platforms, online and offline, you know, incorporating video, as you said, and so we're really bringing to bring full circle, um, being able to reach the um, respondents, your customers or your audience, basically without um, without any limitations. And that is a that is a powerful one, especially um, when we think of the entire world, different um, you know levels of of bandwidth bandwidth versus mobile 4G LTE versus 3G, et cetera, we really need to be able to reach those customers wherever they are. And so that's a critical innovation that has happened and is just coming together and coalescing um, basically now. Yeah. So I agree. That's really good points. And I think the online communities are one of those great feedback tools where you can have um, dialogues with customers and they can reach you when they have something on their mind and you can give direct feedback and have that dialogue. Um, I know those are, you know, companies have embraced, for example, just even WeChat in China to mm -hmm. connect with customers um, are getting much richer yes. Uh, yes. engagement. Very so. true. So just to summarize part one and is that uh, uh, really, we're looking at the set of tools, and uh, one of the the big goals is data, is getting the data. And one of the uh, the big questions uh, in product management, a big challenge for most people, is how do I influence other people in the company, whether it's peers or executives, to support my my plan, to support my this market research, uh, this marketing campaign, or this feature set. And the core answer to getting influence is really having data. And that's, that's really the realm of, of customer research. So jumping to part two is thinking about the uh, best approach to structuring research. Now, this is a big question. And I'm not going to share you know, how to structure a specific interview guide or how to structure a focus group. Those are all important questions, but those are pretty detailed. We won't have time for it. I wanted to share with you just an overall approach and where I see one of the big challenges um, some people fall into and how to avoid that, that problem. It's probably best to go uh, talk about this through an example. 
So let's assume that you're a product leader, product manager, marketer, and you're trying to define a next generation product. You might have one in the market today, uh, and you're trying to enhance that, or maybe you're entering the market and you need a, a new product. So how would you best use your limited R&D budget to create this market advantage? Understand which features, technology, how to apply it. Now I'll focus uh, the structure question with this problem in mind, but the same structure uh, is also relevant whether you're trying to find a new brand identity, identify a marketing campaign, or even a pricing strategy. Um, I see the same structure is important to get uh, reliable results. So let's assume that you are a luggage company and you are trying to create luggage and I'm going to have to go back in time. Let's assume you're in about 1982. So we're, this is a real uh, industry situation but it's a few years old and I like it just because it highlights this problem and I see it again and again but I, I just think it's an interesting one. So let's assume you're uh, in a luggage company and you're looking to develop the next generation suitcase and you work with your R&D team, you've got a lot of ideas for features and, and new functions, and then you decide, I really want to get some, some customer research. I want to get some feedback. I need some data to prioritize all these great ideas. So you do what a lot of uh, good product managers do. You launch a survey. So a typical question might be when considering your next luggage purchase, how important are the following attributes? And you list the features and starts with maybe wheels for easy transport, compartments, security features, materials, etc. You give them a scale of one to five, and that's called a, a Likert scale, a form of a Likert scale, and you ask customers to respond. Sounds good. You launch the survey, you get 500 results, maybe, maybe statistical accuracy, and you get these results. So. Um, the number one thing customers said is they do, in fact, do want wheels for easy transport. Uh, clearly, almost out of five, 4.8 out of five. Next thing they wanted was long-lasting material. So it feels like you got really good answers, and it's, all, it's even statistically valid that now you're ready to take this information, present it to management, drive R&D, and then you, you, you take the product, you get it into the market, and here's what you develop. So I don't know if anybody is old enough to, to uh, have one of these suitcases. I, I guess I'm going to be dating myself. Uh, James, did you own one of these suitcases look like this? I certainly have seen them before. I'll, I'll give you that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know a lot of people had them. I watched a lot of people use them. This, this was a suitcase that was popular in the, in the 80s, and I had this kind of suitcase. And it, was, um, it had the four little wheels on the bottom, and it had a leash. Can't, it's hard to see the leash, but it was a little leash that you drag the suitcase around. And it was almost like walking your dog. <laughs> and every time you carried your suitcase and you went around a corner, the suitcase would fall. Or if you tried to go up an escalator, you had to lift the suitcase, and it defeated the whole purpose of wheels. And if you had multiple suitcases, it was just impossible. The other challenge was it often trailed behind you, so other other uh, passengers in the airport, you know, rushing to their flights would often yeah. run into run into issues trying to get through. So that was a challenge too. Yeah, and they just knock it over, and right, then you exactly. Yeah, because it was always about three feet behind right. you or a meter behind you. Right. So so that's what we got by you know listening uh, to customer or. or uh, asking directly, here's what features we're thinking about and asking customers. So later, as the uh, industry did more research, they actually listened to customers using some different techniques. They discovered there is a better design and that customers really didn't want just wheels on their suitcase. They needed wheels on a suitcase that would actually work with the way a customer was going to carry their suitcase through an airport. And now, of course, everybody um, has this type of suitcase that you're probably very familiar with. So, so what is the challenge? Well, the structure challenge is that what the team didn't do initially was they, they used their ideas, and it was great, but they didn't go deep enough to understand customer needs first before they went out and did quantitative. So the general structure that I, uh, I'm going to suggest and that you can almost always use for uh, more reliable results is always consider doing a market research in campaigns where you've got at least a little bit of uh, qualitative, where you might be using some techniques. The uh, online engagement, where I'm actually engaging with customers online and I'm using questions and dialogue there, or direct customer interviews. And through that 
set of tools, I can then go deeper and go, well, what are you really trying to do with the suitcase? And once I have that information, then I can start using a little more combination of qualitative and quantitative. Focus groups is a good example of that, where I'm presenting options, getting feedback, and I'm starting to build a feedback loop with customers. And then if I really want numbers and I need statistical accuracy, I've got much more rich information to make sure I've got the right set of features, I'm using the right language that customers can relate to, and use online techniques such as a conjoint study or surveys to get those numbers that often management requires and is so comfortable with and, and often is required to get more statistical accuracy on options and uh, to make decisions. Dorian, I think it's this so is a critical piece. Uh, Mark, I, I think this is a critical mm -hmm. piece, and it I think it 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 uh, is worth just reiterating. You mentioned a few slides ago talking about the the two pieces that are very very available, uh, tools and skills. And you know this is where you can take some great tools. Question Pro as an example, and if you have the skills or you have the uh, the consulting or the guidance, you can effectively run these campaigns. And we often see when when we really see effective uh, research being conducted, it often is in some form of a campaign. And this is a fairly complex campaign. It doesn't have to be does not have to be quite this complex. It could be something more straightforward as a stair-stepping process where a max diff study is, uh, you know, is commissioned, and the and the data from that max diff study is what populates the conjoint study. Exactly. exactly. But this is a great example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so now that's the biggest challenge I see, where I often see somebody, they'll launch a big online survey, and, and one of the challenges is um, if you don't know exactly what you're looking for, it's tempting to do a very long online survey or do some a 30-minute survey, ask a lot of questions, and you still don't get the answers you're looking for because you didn't take that step back and do the engagement directly with customers so that you really understand their thinking and how to hone in that survey to ask the specific question yeah. you're looking for. Great points. Great points. So good. So so just to generalize, and I agree that you know if you're looking for a, a dramatic or you know radical innovation, we say product, you might do a three-stage research project. But if you're if you're just looking for um, some insight, you might do a two-stage project. But it almost always the right structure is to do some sort of qualitative first to really understand what you're looking for, how customers are thinking, to really hone in the questions for quantitative. And I'll share with you an example in the tips where if you don't do that, it's just you the reliability of your data is much lower. And it's, it's I see lots of challenges with that and credibility with product leaders. Um, but that's a general approach. And I see that work almost with any market research or any customer research question, whether it's a feature, it's a marketing campaign, it's a branding initiative, et cetera, it's very difficult to jump right to quantitative. So you got to take a step back and do that customer engagement first. So, so related to that is what I call fire and forget. And this is just um, related is that if you're thinking about marketing research as a campaign over time, Sometimes I'll see a market a product teams, particularly, is at the beginning of a project, even before the product is developed, they'll do a lot of great research. And they'll get feedback, and they'll share um, drawings even. And they think that you know, customers love the concept. And then they keep that same information. They keep using it, even the marketing messaging. And they'll use that same information. Time goes by, 12 months, 18 months. Trade-offs are made in development. Implementation reality kicks in. Competitors change. They get it, move it to the market, and then all of a sudden, it's wrong. And this is just something to think about in terms of structuring. Is time is always an element. Which questions are you going to ask at what time, and how to structure that in terms of a campaign? So, all right, so we're just going to let's dive right into some tips because I want to open it to Q and A, and I know we don't have a lot of time today. Yeah, let me make a quick. Uh, I'm just going to share with you from my can. experience. 
Dorian, if I could just remind everyone, because yeah. we have had some questions come through. So in case you joined the call a little bit later after we started, I wanted to mention that we have this questions module that you can use, and you can submit a question at any time, and we'll make sure we include as many of those as we can in the Q&A. So we already have a good number of questions, uh, but I wanted to make sure that everybody had that information so they could they could submit their question okay, if, if it comes up. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great, thank you. So um, let's dive into the five tips, and just I'm just sharing with you from my experience, and there's, there's a lot of uh, details, obviously, in developing the right questions and the right, um, you know, using the right survey tool, and how do you ask a good question in an interview? Those are all very important. I'm just going to share with you from my experience just five tips uh, that I see is often a challenge in, uh, in research projects and maybe some ways to think about it. So the first one is just general, you know, be crystal clear on the answers you seek. And I don't know, maybe James, you can weigh in on this, but I often see a lot of uh, very long uh, surveys. You might be asking customers to take 30 minutes of their time. You get the results back and the, and the client customer looking for the answer, they're, always, they're often disappointed. And a lot of it's just because they really weren't clear on the types of answers they were seeking. And let, let me just share an example of a company. Um, this is a media software company um, in Seattle, where James is located. <laughs> you might know this company, James. Uh, but they did a large research project, and they were trying to understand how customers were using media on the internet. And one of the primary questions they wanted to understand was what was the preference between streaming video and downloading video for later viewing. And the two questions they asked were download videos or view videos online. And they did this, uh, it was about a three month survey, they got 25,000 responses, they presented the results to management. And I remember uh, hearing about the meeting. I wasn't in that meeting, but I heard the results where executives started asking the question, well, what's the difference between downloading and viewing online? And uh, everybody in the room was wondering what the difference was. Mm -hmm. And then they learned that customers who took the survey didn't understand the difference. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so just a basic uh, understanding of what the company is really trying to answer and clear, really clarifying how they're getting the answer was critical before launching this kind of project. Well, Dorian, Have this is where, this kind of oh, oh yes, too many times. It's, sometimes it's it's horribly painful. And I certainly take more than my fair share of very difficult surveys that are way too long um, and have a bad user experience because I'm in the business, so I, I want to see what people are doing. But this is certainly not an isolated incident uh, where you have something like this. And we have, uh, boy, so many you know, so many um, issues can come up even on shorter surveys. This did not necessarily have to be a long survey to get this particular piece of it wrong. And this is where the skill part of the tools and skills comes in, is being able to avoid these pitfalls, which is critical. Yeah, yeah thank you. And, uh, and it takes a little practice sometimes. It's okay to fail. It's key is keep trying and improving on it. Well, and one um, tip I, I would, I think is, is really critical is testing surveys yes. and not the survey administrator but sending it even to family or friends coworkers in different um, departments if that's an option but really getting some feedback on the survey itself before that's published to the target audience yeah. that's a great point I think this particular survey well um, ideally they would have done a little qualitative to understand if, are these even the right questions but just by simple testing this one they could have avoided three months of work looking very bad in front of management and t getting 25,000 responses, they basically had to throw this away and restart it. Painful. So, so tip two, um, often it's really tempting because we are so engaged in our product and our markets that we're often very tempted to ask specific questions about our specific products and asking about a feature and what they'd like to improve. Um, and you're, you're going to get great result answers. Uh, customers are going to want it cheaper, they're going to want to add features. But if you're looking for leadership, um, all of your research can't be focused just on your current product. It's, it's got to be deeper in thinking about future needs. And this is really where uh, qualitative can come in and help guide this. 
So we're looking for research uh, to really think about not just past experiences, but where customers are going. And that's another good use for uh, engagement, is really understanding customer problems going forward, what, what they're trying to accomplish going forward, and structure research around not just the current experiences, but where they want to go in the future. So uh, just an industry example is that if you look at the tablet computers, um, back in the 90s, they were very focused on features and incremental features. And then you look at somebody like Apple who said, you know what, we're not going to focus on current features. We're going to try to rethink this and understand customers. That's when they took this product, said we're going to rethink it, came out with the iPad, and totally redirected the entire uh, tablet computer market. So, so tip number three, uh, and this is particularly important for business to business of product leaders is that there's often an over-reliance on sales input. Uh, and it makes sense that salespeople are out in the market, they're talking to you know, maybe uh, dozens of customers a week, and that, that input is very valuable. But just something to be very aware of is that while they have the best intentions, it doesn't mean you're getting reliable customer insight. Uh, the data is always going to be a little skewed. Everybody has personal opinions. They're weaving into data. You're going to get a lot of summary. You might have 20 customer conversations with a salesperson, and they might be telling you the highlights of two of them. And so it's, um, I, I strongly urge that any product to marketing leaders is really get that direct um, channel with customers to get the insight on it firsthand and use it in addition to sales input so they have a complete uh, picture of that customer insight. So one way to think about it is that uh, a variety of techniques is going to give you more quality of insight. So if you're just relying on sales or channel input, it, it can be very valuable, particularly if you have skilled salespeople that know how to give you that feedback. Uh, but usually that's not the case. And you have to find, as product leaders, market leaders, you have to find your own channels with customers using a variety of tools and then determine, well, how deep do I want to go into getting that insight? and using a set of tools that get you the answer you're looking for. So tip four is, um, I'm guilty of this, is you start getting uh, your favorite question, and I'm a big fan of Likert scales, um, and especially if you haven't you know, looked at a lot of new tools lately, if you've, uh, let's say you're old school, and you only had a certain set of uh, questions that you used three or four years ago or five years, you get comfortable with those questions, and you use Likert scales to rank everything from features to customer satisfaction, or you might rely on open-ended questions to replace real engagement. And I don't know about you, but every time I see an open-ended question on an online survey, I just want to skip it, or I want to answer it as fast as possible and move on. And that's the kind of input you're often getting from customers when you rely on open-ended questions to replace the real engagement of other types of techniques. Well, the other factor there is when you have some mobile respondents as well, and, and that open-ended question, which may be fairly straightforward on a keyboard, is much more challenging with thumbs. Yeah, exactly. So it's going to depend on the platform and how you're getting, uh, even you know, how you're getting it, how long the survey is right. too. And your incentive. Um, if I have no incentive to fill out your survey, I'm going to go through it as fast as possible. So those, you know, some of those factors come in. So just an example of pricing is that you might be tempted to ask a very basic question. You know, what is the reasonable price for this product? You, you share product attributes or you share um, a sample of a product and you ask them, what do you think is a reasonable price? Not a bad question, but there are some better techniques out there. Um, one I like is the Van Western Dorp. That's a consultant's name who created this uh, method for price sensitivity, where it's just a different technique, and these kinds of tools are built into tools like Question Pro, where you don't even have to structure them. They're structured for you, which is nice. It's just becoming aware of the tool and knowing at the right time to use it. So last one, last tip, and I, I think this is the hardest, by far the hardest for every market researcher. Uh, I struggle with this. Um, Every agency I know struggles with this, and that's how do you simulate real-world decisions? Because if you're doing research um, at any level, online, engagement, surveys, focus groups, 
those aren't real world decisions. They're, they're not in the moment of a retail store or in a business to business looking at a brochure and a conversation about uh, actual purchase. So it's going to be tempting to just use or get research in isolation of the real world and assume it's real world and, and say that all oh, surveys in a survey customers love this product. The message tested great in focus groups and then you realize once it gets into the real world it didn't your your research wasn't accurate it wasn't reliable now this is where I think there is a lot of innovation happening in terms of doing real world um, uh, research but this is still expensive it still does require agencies as product and market leaders our job is try to simulate it as close as possible using the most cost-effective tools we have available uh, and that's a challenge. And that's I think engagement helps with that. And just as an example, um, I think one of the big tools and in innovations that have really come down in price is a tool called conjoint analysis, or it's a trade-off analysis, where instead of asking a question like on the left, it's more of a Likert scale, I can put in specific products with my competitors' brands with different pricing options and ask customers to do a real trade-off analysis. Now, when you think about online shopping, most customers, that's how they shop today. I'll get three um, options on Amazon or um, JD.com, and you're making those trade-offs. And with some of the tools today, you can actually simulate that online trade-off decision. And, um, and that's something just to really aspire to, is how do you create a real-world environment so you get to real-world feedback. So, so that's my last tip, tip number five. James, do you have any tips that you would add to that from your, I'm sure you've got your hot buttons. What's, what's one tip that you'd like to offer? Well, you really, you really honed in on some critical things here. You know, I think that I also mentioned a few things before. These are all great. Conjoint that you mentioned here in this this last example is often preceded, as I mentioned before, by a max diff study or or um, maybe some open ended questions in a you know in a survey, so that you can figure out what these critical um, attributes are. These these specific things that we need to to drill down in to get to the point where we can find out what these trade-offs are for the customer. So um, that's where the skills come in and the campaign level of structuring research comes in, which is critical, especially for something like this where you want this uh, high quality end result that you actually can um, make a decision on. So these are all critical things. I mentioned testing as well. That I think is a really important one and testing uh, by someone who is objective, not someone who has actually spent, you know, weeks or potentially months drafting, creating, revising the survey um, to get some some critical feedback on the survey itself. Because often you you can um, burn a bridge. Is I don't know if that's a if that's a global expression, but certainly something that we say in the U.S. where you can burn bridges very quickly if you're um, presenting the same. Uh, respondent or respondent pool with too many similar questions because you're having to revise in order to you know get to something meaningful so it's good to do the research up front but as you mentioned it's often a process and uh, it's okay to make mistakes um, we just want to try to avoid those uh, get the support and the consulting that we need so that we get to a, a usable finished product but best practices are, are pretty available so those are critical as well we want to try to you know, incorporate as many of those as we can into our research. Yeah, good. So, yeah, and you can't forget some of the basics such as, you know, keep research uh, short and focused. Um, you know, my favorite, and this doesn't happen much anymore, but I remember I used to get in the mail a survey that might take me an hour to complete, and they would send me a dollar <laughs> in the envelope. And that was my incentive to fill out their one-hour survey. So, right. especially today, customers' attention spans are very short. Uh, the less relevant it is to them, that's a, another really critical reason to qualitative before quantitative. Is that if you do quantitative, that's not clear and related to to the customer and how they think and where they want to focus, you just get dropouts. You might you might send a thousand surveys, and your dropout rate is going to be ninety percent. Yeah, very good point. Very good point. Well, uh, short and relevant. Yeah, absolutely. Do you want to jump into a few questions? 
Yeah. So, yeah, oh, no, yeah, I'll let you finish. Yeah, absolutely. We, we do have some questions. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Great. Yeah. Oh, you want to do questions now? I, I didn't oh. want to cut you off here. <laughs> well, on let, the... me just, let me just wrap up and then yes. let's... Perfect. Let me wrap up and share an opportunity, one of the reasons we, we were here on the call today. Um, just to share it, so I talked in the beginning that, you know, market, uh, anytime you have a, a professional job, it really comes down to having the right tools and the right skills to do it. Market research is a big, can be, feel like a big topic. Now, my advantage is I feel very fortunate in my career. I've always been able to use market research. It's really helped propel me in some cases to success. And I had the advantage of an MBA program where I had several classes in market research. That was one of my focuses. And I just found it so valuable. And I know a lot of product leaders don't get that opportunity. And one of the reasons we wanted to share with you today is that um, we, we created a program for, to help people that don't have those kinds of opportunities. Um, this is a two-day program that is, uh, we've created uh, with, through, with and through China Eno as part of our product management and innovation leadership series. Where, and the goal is to give uh, people hands-on experience. So it's one thing to talk about research. It's a very different thing to actually practice and do research. And so we wanted to develop a very hands-on, interactive program uh, using live tools. And that's why we brought uh, you guys, Question Pro, into it, is to have a tool that we could actually practice on and use in the program. So I just wanted to share that and um, obviously contact us if there's any interest in that. But let's, let's dive to a q and I'd love to hear what people are thinking. Yeah. So we had a great question about you mentioned um, relying on not relying on sales too too micro focused in the sales to get reliable information, um, but the, but this question is is uh, it's really good. The question is how do you recommend working with sales then, uh, you know, as as part of the research process? Yeah, and that, that's a challenge, especially in business to business markets, because uh, sales are tasked with owning the customer. They're they're um, their, their value to the company is those customer relationships, so they're very careful with them. So it's really, it's often it's the product leader, the market leader is, is building, has to build a relationship with sales, make sure that they're very clear on the objectives, and the, the more clear you are and the more skilled you are with market research, the easier it is for sales to say, yes, I, wanna, I, I want you to talk to my customers. Um, and they also want the data, so as long as they understand uh, that the research is, is for a good purpose and it's going to help them. They're usually supportive. And you're looking for sales support for a couple of ways. One is you need often need their database. Sometimes they have access to customers that you don't have access to, so you need um, access to uh, customer uh, information. And if you're going to do deeper research, such as uh, customer interviews, you actually want their uh, maybe to recommend and introduce you to potential customers. So the key is just making it uh, relevant for customers. Make sure you're not sharing things that customers don't want you to share in research and bringing them in as part of the process. And they're usually very happy to get the results if they're good results. I think they could help with the initial testing of the survey and deciding which attributes, you know, in the case of the conjoint study too, I think they could be very insightful in the types of questions that are asked to help, uh, you know, hone in on the, the focus of the research. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you don't want to ignore that. And particularly when you get the results back and you didn't involve them in that, they're going to say, well, wait a minute, I had, these were three features, three attributes that I think we needed to test, and you didn't test it, and then they won't, they won't support the results. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. Um, there's a question here about working with market research agencies. Um, how, how would this presentation change if, if, if someone worked mostly with market research agencies? Well, from my experience, in, in market regions, agencies, they're, um, they're experts in these types of tools. Um, a lot of companies rely on them because of that. There is a learning curve on using these. But um, So my recommendation for any product or market leader is that if you work with agencies, that's fantastic. That means you have a budget, which is great because <laughs> agencies are not cheap. <laughs> right. But you really need a combination. Oftentimes, if you over-rely on a market research agency, they're the ones getting a lot of the learning. They're doing this testing. They're doing the preliminary work to get to these surveys. And so they're doing a lot of the learning, plus, plus the expense and the time involved. So I recommend it's a hybrid where absolutely work with agencies if you get the budget, but to also build your own capability and, and your own small set of tools that you can use to get faster feedback, cheaper, and more consistently. 
um, and, and work with an agency in conjunction. Uh, if you're new to market research, one tip is to start working with an agency, learn their secrets, have them teach you, and then you start building up those skills to bring some of it in-house and to do your own work with your own tools. Especially today, with, with the online tools available, the access to uh, communities, most product and market leaders can do a lot of customer insight work themselves. Hmm. Great point. Yeah. Um, here's another question. Um, yeah, it looks like you're using Question Pro in the workshop. Is, is this training for this specific tool? Um, well, we thought it was very important to use a live tool that uh, we believed was feature rich and had a good range of types of tools and um, was easy enough to use. Uh, so we do use Question Pro in the, in the program as examples. We also do other uh, research techniques that aren't based on online that wouldn't be based on Question Pro. But a lot of uh, what we do in the program is going to be a carryover um, that what you could do in Question Pro, you could also do in other online research tools. So it's not specifically to Question Pro, but we did feel it was very important to have a live uh, interactive experience and to use a live tool. And so we selected Question Pro as a good, a good candidate. Yeah, fair enough. Um, it looks like there's a lot of focus on current customers. How should we think about non-customers? Oh, yeah. Uh, and that is a challenge. Um, getting access to non-customers um, can be a challenge. Um, so especially if you're looking for uh, real market insight looking forward, you can't just rely on current customers. you got to include um, projects that might have an equal amount of current customers and potential customers or even past customers. So you've got you to create a blend. And sometimes that gets, you have to get creative. You might have to work through channel partners. You might have to purchase lists. Uh, for people in the industry, uh, but you can't ignore non-customers, particularly, um, you know, that, that's just one of the challenges. If you're always talking to the same customers, listening to the same customers, you're going to get the same answers and you're going to have the same strategy and all of a sudden a competitor move by you and you wonder why. Mm -hmm. It's because you kind of get stuck in that same mode. Mm -hmm. So you've got to consider both. And two more questions here. Could you, could you put the slide that talked about the class back up? Oh, two questions actually. One was, will we be distributing the slides here that you presented from this webinar today? Um, I'll let you guys. So, Sophie, you still on? Uh, yes, I'm here. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> so we can almost hear you. <laughs> Sophie, so, I can um, certainly get you the attendee list very quickly, and um, if we want to distribute that, if you know, with your permission, Dorian, uh, since most of this was your content here. Um, yeah, this is certainly fine by me. That would be great. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll send it out um, in PDF form so you can uh, read it easily. And you know, happy to share this information. And then the last question here, and I know we're a little bit over time. I appreciate everyone's attention uh, and patience and sticking out with us here. Is um, the program this program? Is this in uh, English or Chinese? Uh, it's actually could be bilingual. It depends on uh, if it's an internal training and they are okay with English. It's good just a truly English, or if they request a Chinese translation, we will have the spontaneous interpretation. But for the public, normally we will be signing for Chinese and English. So if, if you didn't quite hear Sophie because she was a little bit quiet there, it's it's bilingual, so it would be the, the preferences of the attendees, it sounds like. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. It depends okay. On the Great. So to, to get more information about the, uh, this program, it's Sophie King at ChinaEno.com? Yes, yes, this is my uh, email address, so just feel free to send me any of your questions or, you know, any problem or anything you want from me. Well, that sounds great. Uh, Dorian, thank you so much for your time. This was excellent content and great information, great dialogue. Um, Sophie, thank you so much for joining us and for and for your time. And uh, you know, I will I'll just say I would love to attend. I won't be in China during this time, but I would love to attend. It sounds like great content, and uh, I think that uh, regardless of someone's level of experience conducting market research, we often see some of the biggest culprits are those who have been in the industry for 20 or 30 or more years because we, we as you mentioned, we, get, we, we have our favorite question types, we get into habits, we fall out of best practices, 
and um, it's always great to have those refreshers and to have this very focused, uh, you know, customization of, of learning so that we can all be better innovators and, uh, and, and better researchers. Yeah, I think that's a really good point is on the, the technology is moving very quickly to create those communities and to do the engagement. And if I, you know, luckily I'm in this field, I get to stay up on some of these latest tools. But I know when I was in product management, I might let my skills lapse for a couple of years. And all of a sudden, I would learn, wait a minute, I can do a virtual focus group. I don't have to invite eight people. Right. So yeah, just having a refresher, um, I, I always find valuable. Absolutely. Well, that's it for our questions. Thank you very much for your time. We appreciate all of the attendees. Thank you for joining us for Market Research for Product and Marketing Leadership. And I hope you will, will, um, will learn more about the class structure and are able to attend that. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Thank James. You, James. Okay. Thank you both. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.